Hello, my name's Rob and welcome to Swift Slots and welcome back to part three of the Capri upgrade build. So enjoy. Okay, so I've run into a small hiccup that I've had to correct. But first of all, I'll give you some numbers. Now, a lot of slot car axles are 2.38 mil. Now, to the new, new beginner, that seems like a very weird size, 2.38. Well, what is 2.38 and why is it 2.38? Well, quite simply, it's Imperial for 332. Now, this is a reamer for 330 seconds, which will ream out any hole to take a nice 2.38 mil axle, which is 332, to make bearings and so on. So if I wanted to make a bearing, for example, through this front axle, I can turn up my brass blanks and then run my reamer through the bearing and that gets me exactly to 2.38 or 3.30 seconds. So that's where we get to 2.38. Now, some of you may be aware, but beginners certainly won't be, that NSR and slot it don't use the same standard size bore. NSR use a slightly smaller bore and it's something like 2.34 or something like that. It's just a hair short, which means if you buy an NSR gear, it won't fit on a slotted axle or a standard axle because NSR are undersized. However, if you buy yourself a reamer, a 330 seconds reamer, you can actually ream out the NSR gear so that the NSR gear becomes a standard fitment to slot it. And also the same with your wheels. Now these are actually NSR wheels, so you could run a reamer through your wheel and you could get that to be a standard size wheel, no problems at all. There's a common misconception that NSR won't fit onto a standard axle. Well, it will. So I'll put my standard axle in this vise and do it up nice and tight so I can grip it. Now, because it's only a few fractions different, watch this. No, not that. This. With a little bit of pressure, it actually does go on. You can actually get an NSR gear onto a slotted axle. Now, I've put this on and off a couple of times, so it's a little bit easier. But even still, I've not touched it with the reamer. I've just eased it. And the great thing about a tight fit on the axle is that that gear will run beautifully straight even when you tighten up the grub screw and normally when you tighten up a grub screw on a on a nice easy fit tolerant shaft you'll pull the gear one way or the other but if it's tight to start with you won't so there's actually an advantage to fitting the NSR gears onto a slotted axle the same with the wheels this is an NSR wheel exactly the same deal actually this one's got the grub screw and let me just back that grub screw out slightly otherwise we're going to be pushing past that actually just take it out completely there we are. Right, so NSR wheel onto a slotted axle. Yeah, it's tight, but there you go. It's completely on. Now, the beauty of that is that wheel will run beautifully straight, even with the grub screw done up nice and tight because it won't be pulling it this way. So it can work. It does work. It's not the done thing. And if you're going to go to a race and you need to swap wheels and tyres and so on, I wouldn't advise it. But if you're doing a, a casual build like I am here and you want to use NSR gears or NSR wheels on a slotted axle, they will push on. Alternatively, get yourself a reamer, a 330 seconds reamer, hand reamer, and you can get your wheel and you can just gently ream it out with your reamer and open it up to the standard 330 seconds or 2.38 slotted axle. So, bit of information, but I've got a problem. This reinforcing bar here is in the way. Now my NSR gear that I was hoping to use fits on in that orientation there because of the angle of the teeth. Now that's a problem because my wheel would have to go onto there and it's sitting too far out on the wheel, on, on the axle, for the bodywork because I need to clear some clearance for the motor. So if it sits like that, you can see that the motor, this side of the pinion is much further out. And when you put that into the context of the wheel, you can suddenly see that I've got big interference problems. So what I needed to do is have the gear on this side. Now that's not gonna work with this NSR gear, and some more numbers for you. 
This gear is a 16.8 mil diameter gear, so it's 16.8 millimeters across the width of it. Now by a 31 tooth. Now most gears are done by numbers of teeth which determine the diameter. And you'd think that would be the case with these gears, and maybe it is. But this is a slotted gear, and it's an 18 mil gear. So the other problem that I had with these gears is when I put the gear on here in the correct orientation, it wouldn't actually marry up with the gear in the pod. It was missing it by miles. I don't know if you can quite see that. If I put the gear in there, because uh, I've put the pod in there, you can't see. But this gear wasn't even touching the pinion. Now, normally what you do is you bring the gear out and that brings the mesh. But I can't bring the gear out because I've got my tire in the way. So basically, I needed this gear flipped around and put into here so that it goes really tight up against the inside of this bearing housing. And then I can get my spacing on my wheel, as you can see from there, as it all goes in, it'll all clear. But as I said, this is a 16.8 mil gear on an NSR, and that won't touch this 10 tooth pinion. So I've ended up finding this slotted gear, which is actually a 3.30 seconds bore anyway, so it fits my axles normally. It's also got the angle of the teeth pointing in this direction, so it's tapered. Um, oh, I can't, well, anyway, it's tapered, and that will go onto there and marry up nicely with my gear. But the problem is, this bar is in the way, so I need to get it in there like that. And then, once I get it in there, then I've got some clearance naturally, and it'll all fit in quite happily like that. It'll just slide in, and anyway. So, what I've got to do now is I basically got to liberate this section of the chassis here, put a very small ease bend in there, get that gear so that it drops in to here, and then it'll all marry in. And just, I forgot to say, this is an 18 mil gear, and the 18 mil gear marries up to this 10 tooth pinion beautifully, and the angle of the teeth are all in the right place. It's not easy to work out these gears online. They don't give you hardly any information, and I did try and find out what gears fit this pod, I didn't get an answer from the retailer, so I had to guess. So knowing that this 16.8 didn't quite touch the teeth at all, I went up to 18 mil and it works. So you could, I also bought a couple of spare pinions as well, just to go up on the pinion if I need to do up or down to ease the, the, the fitment, but I was lucky I got it in one. So my 10 tooth pinion does actually fit on there nicely. So that's all good. But it would help if the manufacturers gave you a lot more information on what combination will rudimentarily fit between these points. But they don't. So here we are. We're left in the world of guesswork. So that's what I've got to do now. Open up this piece of brass. Get that gear in there. Get that all meshing properly. And then I can get my wheel on. And the chassis is done. A little bit of fiddling around I've got the rail back in and all adjusted into place and that's what it looks like from the underside oh, fairly close but it's all in there I've checked it on the body it all fits nicely on the body all clears exactly as it should so what I'll do is I'll just take off these screws now and I'll show you what I got going on behind the wheels okay there it is. So as you can see, there's been a bit of a joggle here. So I've created this gap, which is what was required for the gear. And I've joggled it back in up here, put a fresh set of three pins in, as you saw on the video there, because they broke off. I deliberately took them off because it's easier to remake them. And there's a little bit of a scallop here just to allow for the bottom of the gear, a little bit of a scallop here to allow for the pinion of the motor. And I've also added in a couple of these extra little supports just soldered into the corner just to stop because obviously these pieces here when they're in flex flex quite easily because you're flexing 
um, with the metal. I'll demonstrate with a ruler. If you try and flex this way, you can't. But obviously if you flex this way, you can, like that. And that's what these pieces of metal here would be doing. They would be flexing fairly easily. So not easily, but just flexing. I don't want flex if I can help it. I don't want, I don't mind flex this way. But I don't want flex in the metal. So that's why I've added in these little bits of support in here and here. They don't add wild amounts of strength, but they definitely do stiffen it up. Okay, so with the back end all finished, now I've got to turn my attentions back to the front and get this front axle turning freely in the, in the old stub axles. And all they are is the original stub axle, just there with the stubs pulled out and then just clipped back into place. And they happen to take a standard axle. And as you can see, there's reason reasonably free, but not quite. So I'll ream that axle out and get it running smoothly. So the way I'm going to ream out these front stub axles, I got myself a 2.5 mil drill uh, with the shaft exposed. So what I'll do is I'll just drill that through there and then keep it going into the other one and allow the drill shank or allow, allow the stub axle to run up onto the shank here. And what that's doing is that's actually polishing the inside of that bearing, so to speak. So we'll just pull it out whilst rotating and it should fall out there fairly, yes it does. And then come back in from this side and do exactly the same. And then we're using the other side now as a guide. And again, let it run all the way up onto the shoulder here, so that it's polishing the plastic as well. Again, keep it moving as you pull it out. And there we are. Right, what have we got? Ah, that's better. Right, nice and free. I'll just show you now. If I put a wheel on there, you can see that is now nice and free. And there's basically no play in that whatsoever but it is nice and free to turn. So that's the front axle done. So really we've got the front axle done. We've got the back axle done and we've got the guide all done. So now we can actually assemble the chassis up for the final time and set the ride height. There we are. One completely overly complicated, unnecessarily complex Fly Capri modified chassis. As you can see, we've got a Matus axle stopper on one side to control the end float of the axle. We've got NSR six and a half mil body screws with the clear shanks to control the pod float. And there's a little bit of pod float in there. 
We've got my homemade 30 Shore PU tyres. We've got a nice NSR motor in there, silicon wires, hot glued in the corner there just to keep them down so we can get the front end working. Nicely free running front axle, nicely free dropping front guide, and also nicely centering. And also when we put it on the setup plate and we move it, we get a little tiny bit of wheel movement there. So the tires are just about touching the floor. And then you could they're free to turn with your fingers as well. So that's exactly what you want. So there we are, that's all done. And put a little bit of power to the back wheels and get it to run. There you go. No problems at all, very, very smooth. Okay, so one job that I've done off camera, is is a little bit boring, is to make the original interior fit the chassis. Now I did say that I wasn't gonna make this as the ultimate racer, and I'm not going to, which is why I want to leave in a reasonable dollop of the original interior, because it just adds to the model, I think. So all it is very boring, it's just a case of chomping it away with the Dremel and files until you've made all the relevant clearances. It's very easy to do with the body on, but with the glass out and with the bare chassis. You can see exactly where the interior is hanging up and you can just trim away the relevant plastics. And then all I've done is I've put back this cross member here, uh, turned it around the other way in fact, and it's probably not right, but who cares. Just glued it in from the back so the detail is still there. I had to move what I think could be the fuel tank forwards a hair. That little silver bit of detail there needs to come off while I was removing this groove here. And then once it was all done and clearing the arm on the pod, I was able to glue it back. I've resprayed the seat in from red to silver. I've resprayed the helmet blue and I've painted the gloves blue to tone the driver down a bit. The great thing with these fly figures is the visor and the helmet come off and out. So the helmet comes off and the visor comes out completely. So you can just simply respray the helmet, put it all back together again, and you get perfect lines because it all comes apart. So that's really cool. The other thing that I've done is I've put a wrap over the NSR motor, painted the end bell, just so that when you put the interior back in, it all sort of vaguely disappears. And then the last job that I've got to do is repair this glass. And if you look closely on part one, you'll see the glass has a great big crack in it. And I did try and repair this, but it wasn't going anywhere. However, I did repair this side glass. So somebody had tried to repair the door mirror with a bit of super glue historically and got super glue on the glass. So what I did is I got a blade, a brand new scalpel blade, and I scraped all the super glue away, being careful not to scrape the plastic. And then with a bit of 3,200 grit, micro mesh sandpaper incredibly fine i was able to just polish the corner of that glass and then once it, all the marks have come out with a bit of paint renovator which is basically tea cut put it on a cotton earbud oops and then i was able to polish all the marks out and then buff off with a rag and as you can see that is not too bad at all. All that glue is gone. Oh yeah, I've got to re repaint in the window frame. That's no biggie at all. But in terms of the actual super glue, pretty much gone. But the glass here is a problem. So I'm going to have to chop it out completely, make up my own Lexan front screen, put a mask on to put in a new sun visor and create a brand new front windscreen because that crack is not going to work.
the glass is all in. I ended up using aluminium foil tape to bond the glass back in, cut it up into small squares like this and lay it in and get it where I want it. Once the aluminium takes the shape of where you want it to go, it won't move. Unlike ordinary tape that relaxes, aluminium tape stays formed and it's very, very sticky. So that's why I've used that. Right, onto the front headlight. So, just about the last job to do is to replace that lens that I said was missing in the opening video. So there is the lens and it just drops into this recess here, like that. So, what I'm going to do, I've got this piece of old 6mm Perspex, so a piece of a drill guard. I'm going to chop off a piece and I'm going to pop that square piece into the four jaw chuck and I'm going to turn up a lens. face and that will just go in there like that hopefully the uh, camera is going to pick that up there you go done There you go finished i'm really happy with the way it's turned out these colors really bring back memories of my old radio controlled racing days and the chassis come together well as well there was a scary moment with the gears i thought they weren't gonna quite fit but I managed to circumnavigate that and it's all come together in a very nice coherent package and i think it looks really nice so how did it do round crow valley well this is always going to be a hard car to get going fast around Crow Valley because it's so wide and it's so long, especially coming around that back straight as you dive down into the tunnel. That's quite tight for a wide car because you tend to be going into it slightly sideways and you give it too much. It'll bounce off the side of the bridge and it causes problems. So you've got to ease off and just come through there nicely and, and get a smooth line. And there are all the other tight bends as well. So this is always going to be difficult to get around Crow Valley really quickly. But as I've said many times before, 50 seconds is, sorry, 55 seconds is a good time. 50 seconds is quick. Anything faster than 50 seconds is really, really flying. So how did it do? It did this. <laughs> I created a monster. Well, not really, but I'm very pleased with it. Would it go around a great big professional wooden track? Who knows? Probably not. But around Crow Valley, it goes really, really well. Very smooth and very predictable. The motor is superbly smooth. The slotted gears are very quiet, very smooth. The motor pod seems to keep the chassis in check. 
the modifications that I've done to the front guide all seem to work really well. Not once did the car feel like it was become, gonna become unstable and de-slot, it was just planted. Coming around the back of Crow Valley as you dive underneath the bridge, that can be tricky, especially for a really wide car like the Capri. No problems at all though, very smooth and very predictable. And my tires that I made, they worked really well as well. They didn't wheelie on acceleration like some of the super grippy NSR tires can do. And if you give it too much power, it should go into a slide, but not overly unpredictable. And you could bring it back and you could keep it planted and just keep powering through. Keep the tires clean and they'll return really, really good grippy laps. So if you want a set of these tires, link below. So I really hope that you enjoyed this content. And if you did, maybe you'll subscribe. And if you hit the little bell, that would be awesome. So until the next time, thank you very much.